Well, welcome to this week's episode of Minis Motorbikes. Now, where are we today? We're coming from... the National Motorcycle Museum. In Birmingham? Yes, with 171 different British motorbike makes and marks. Wow. And apparently everybody's up here this weekend, including people like Steve Parrish, uh, Henry Cole. Because it's the 40 years. 40 years years. this museum's been open. So let's go and have a wander around and uh, see what we can find. See what we see. See if there's anything you fancy. Mm. So we've bumped into uh, a lot of people bump into yeah. me and then they just walk off the other way. Yeah. Oh, sorry, old man. That's the one. <laughs> That's yeah. what I get now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway, Steve. Yeah. We bumped into you again. Yep. Park uh, Soccer Museum. Yeah. Why are you here? Uh, I'm here because I was invited to be here and I've been coming for about the last three years actually. This is Motorcycle Museum Live as such where uh, I'm helping out with the dragsters, some dragster bikes over the back and you'll have to go and film them because they are so noise, so loud um, and so smelly. They've got nitromethane in them, they're proper monsters and they're all from the sort of 60s and 70s where drag bikes back then were built in garden sheds yeah. and there is some proper monsters there's a 500 horsepower one out there it's got two Norton Weslake engines in it runs on yeah. nitromethane it's got turbochargers and uh, superchargers and everything else and it's a real monster so I'm involved with doing that yeah. and then I'm also uh, doing some stuff with Henry Cole on the stage yeah. in the back there she, she where we talk a load of rubbish <laughs> and garbage and have questions from the floor and have a bit of a giggle really um, and it all works extremely well James uh, who in runs this uh, event puts on a great show lots and lots of people turn up it's free to get in that's probably one yeah, of the nice yeah, attractions if yeah. you come it's on your bike cars park, pay for parking yeah if you're in a car you pay for parking but if you come on a bike it's completely free yeah, um, it's open nearly every day apart from Christmas Day Boxing Day and Christmas Eve and you, obviously the usual isn't it but, uh, absolutely yeah. and and honestly if you've not ever been here um, you need to come here because uh, you've just said uh, it is I've never I, been here. I never, never really even realised it was here you walk it's around here yeah you walk around here and you come across manufacturers and people that made bikes that I've never ever heard of no. and some of them only made about four of them and then they went broke and then this and that and everything else but there is some gorgeous gorgeous stuff in here and bearing in mind you have to remember I can't remember how many years ago half this burned down yeah so they've yeah, had to complete 
three, I think. Was it? it was right, OK. Well, they've had to... Well, so it's 20 years ago, then. Yeah. Um, they've had to restore a lot of the ones that got burnt, but they've built it back up, and I absolutely love it. I've been coming here for many years, and I still come along and think, well, I haven't seen that, I haven't seen that. But they do alternate them, so year by yeah. year, things get changed. Yeah, yeah it's, it's something you've got... You have got to spend a day to look around it. Mm. No you question about it's, it. It's not a 10-minute thing, is it? No, not right. at all. No, 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 right. no. Favourite, favourite bike? Favourite bike is be difficult, but I've, I'm not going to buy one because I've got too many <laughs> motorbikes. Unless I sell really? But I've always wanted a kind of a pre-construction Bonneville, something like yeah, that. Lovely. Um, yeah. And I've got a Dominator racer and a this and a that and everything else. But I guess I always dreamed of owning a Bonneville, could never afford one. I always ended up with a Tiger 100 or something lesser. Um, but maybe if I am squeezed and perhaps going to buy something else, it will be a, a lovely kind of that... Um, nice blue and silvery coloured Bonneville something yeah, like lovely. that so one of your bikes won't end up in here then one of my bikes might end up in here but you never know but I haven't got that many British ones as you know I've got mainly Japanese, yeah, Japanese. two strokes yeah. and, and things like maybe my Panther sidecar outfit I don't know who knows yeah. Maybe we'll wait and see. Waxwork of you, waxworks of you, in it. Well, it'd be a dummy, <laughs> wouldn't it? It'd be definitely a dummy. No, I say we put a waxwork. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, no, fantastic. No, it's been lovely bumping into you again. Good seeing we'll you. Get some more clips of you somewhere around the. Yeah, well, you have um, to come out and see these drag bikes. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah, the, the noise is great, and then come and join us in the well. big hall where we'll be having a chat. And uh, I think uh, Alan Milliard's in there starting the Nemesis V8, oh, yeah. which sounds absolutely brilliant, mm. uh, and it's much better than it was when it was first designed. It never, it was still born it never actually made it to production but it sounds absolutely brilliant uh, but bring your earplugs with you and maybe see you in there thank you um, and the majority of the bikes here unbelievably were built in garden sheds in people's kitchens you name it i've been talking to some of the guys and all these guys that have kindly brought their lovely bikes along it's their pride and joy they raced as i said back in the 60s and 70s they still come out on occasions at drag stalger i think it's called which is at santa pod and that is at the end of june if you want to see these things in action that's where you need to be santa pod near bedford in that uh, area there where these lovely bikes will actually unfortunately we can't kind of we can start them today but there's not enough room here to do a quarter mile down there but there is some bikes here and uh, this one behind me here um, i can tell you it's about 500 brake horsepower um, and it went to, its top speed was around 180 miles an hour on something way back there in the 70s. It's an extraordinary piece of equipment. But every one of these spikes here has won some sort of championship, some sort of a record. Um, it, it will smell, trust me. It will smell and burn your eyes because a lot of them run on nitromethane and it's very volatile. These guys here all have to have a license to actually buy the fuel because it's some kind of an explosive. Chris, uh, Chris Hillman, with me here you've coordinated getting all these bikes here together congratulations on that i know they're most of my mates of yours but it must be a kind of nice feeling for you to hear them running again yeah it's a fantastic opportunity and we're extremely grateful to the museum uh, to allow us to uh, put on this show um you did say that the guys have brought the uh, bikes here but you've got to remember that most uh, a lot of these bikes are actually in the museum yeah. Uh, and uh, thankfully they allow us to take them out now and again to uh, give them some exercise. Um, you know, I'm fortunate in as much that uh, something like 60 years ago I watched uh, Nero and George Brown at Brighton Speed Trials mm. uh, and I, I thought, well, you know, that, what an amazing... Uh, uh, view site, yeah, I guess. Yeah, a, yeah, a fantastic. I thought, oh, I'm going to do that one day. Never in a million years did I ever dream that the museum would grant me permission to ride the damn thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, really grateful. Hope everybody uh, enjoys it. Um, one thing you didn't mention that uh, we think is important is these things running on nitromethane can be an absolute animal to start. So please have a little bit of patience. Well, they told me this yesterday. They said the temperature was too cold for them all to start. And I think we had six bikes yesterday and every one of them started. Yeah. So no bleeding excuses now, lads. So <laughs> uh, they're all better be going because they do sound absolutely brilliant. So basically, Triumph 650 bottom end it started off as. It started with a T110 bottom end. I was just buying bits off, uh, off eBay. And I didn't really know much about it. My dad had given up the sport many years before. Right. And then uh, as I was Recruiting the bits, a lot of original bits from the 70s. He came round and he was standing in my garage and he went all quiet and he said, mm, We're not going to do it like that. 
and it just went from there and he got involved and we started putting it together. Okay. Um, the main thing I wanted to do was honour some bits and pieces that him and his racing partner Pete Miller did back in the 70s, which was the first commercially available two-speed train bike gearbox and clutch. Right, they designed and built that? It, it's, yes, it's based around a Laycock overdrive. Okay. So it gives you the ability to um, do a full throttle gear change, so basically an automatic gear. Which was new in those days. <laughs> well, the technology of an epicyclic wasn't, but using it in a drag bike was in Europe anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, turbo? It's supercharged. supercharged. It's, it's, uh, the, the only real modern component on there is that it's an even supercharger from a, a mini or small Mercedes. Okay. And um, it only runs on methanol. Right. Um, pure methanol? No. It's pure methanol. Is it? Yeah, just making the step up to nitro is expensive right and okay. I'm, I'm not ready for it yet. right because nitro what is about 60 quid a gallon or something it's, it? it's a lot and just right. the dangers and the potential right. with the blowing the engine and stuff like that okay. so, yeah. all right now this would have i guess started out live at 50 horsepower or something 45 it's low yeah i mean wouldn't i say what it is now but in the hands of a decent rider if there's any volunteers out there uh, right i think it could do quite well i'm sure it can any idea what sort of horsepower it puts out now roughly anyone anyone what's it doing 80, 80, 80 to 100 horsepower yeah, yeah. from, yeah. from what it started, I thought about 40 weight horsepower. Yeah. Right, right, you didn't run it yesterday, so yeah. you've got an excuse because you didn't run yesterday, but are you confident it's going to start? Uh, let's see how it goes, it is a bit cold today, but um, we'll, we'll try our best. Alright, let's okay. give it a go, we want to hear it, don't we? Let's start with a, one of the smaller capacity machines, we've got it, it's up to an 850 now, isn't it? Did you uh, say? 750 more goes. 750, right, okay. Let's give it a run. First we've got to do is start the donkey engine. seen better days sure. um, but Chris yeah. is going to yeah, wheel it onto the back. rollers in a minute and we'll give it a run up so fuel going on is this running on just straight fuel this one what's no, it's it? running on uh, about 20% 20 nitro okay some are running I think 90% nitro but 20% nitro which as I said before you have to have a license to be able to buy it um, it is basically explosives so what are we doing? Tickling her up, getting the fuel coming through nicely. We'll have a little run here in a minute as well. So this is Nero in the museum, uh, is where it's based. What a beauty. How about that? What? 
Chris, what was this a top tower at then, the top speed? Uh, the Brighton Speed Car C uh, on the kilometre, it had 186 miles an hour. Oh, shit. <laughs> 186 miles an hour in the you're not allowed like, to say that. Uh, yeah, no, you're not allowed to say that. Sorry, I apologise for my terrible letters. I meant to say shite. Um, but that is quite amazing, and you have ridden this bike on numerous occasions, haven't you? It's a lot of history behind it. Yeah, the museum have uh, been uh, very generous. Uh, I've ridden it at George Brown Memorial Sprint, uh, and uh, probably one of the most enjoyable ones was taken out of the hill of Goodwood. Right, up the hill of Goodwood, yeah, yeah that, would have, that would have been a real monster up there. But I do yeah. think you need a new rear tyre on there next yeah, time you yeah, take it yeah. Yeah. Museum. This is where you walk in basically, so the history of the bike starts. We work all the way through history. So a lot of these are all bike based. We've got three wheelers, 1898, I think that's probably one of them. Uh, the Beast and Hummer. James will probably talk about that later. That's the oldest bike in here, where it all started really I think. And obviously we'll walk away around and we'll walk away down. Came past the three wheelers, which probably could do the Brighton run because of that age, 1904. Oh, some nice rudges. And then we're coming onto the singer now. This is bicycles where they all started, really. They all upgraded bicycles and put motors on them. See, it wasn't just sewing machines. Look, got an old singer. Mum had one of them, Mark. <laughs> and then we've got one of these square tanks. Lovely brass, lovely brass tank. So they're all bicycle based. Rubber chains, stunning, absolutely stunning. and girls, another one of my favourites, Bruff Superior, S100, 1930, you can buy it new for 160 quid, they're worth about a quarter of a million now, Lawrence of Arabia, famous rider, sadly lost his life on one, it's another one, look at it, look at it, it's beautiful, look. CC. Stunning. Oh, corner copia of Norton's. Look, look. 36, 35, 29, 29. Look at them. Model 18, look. Bloody beautiful. That's what I want. I want one of them. Model 18. Look at that. The 1908 Norton V Twin JAP 750. Look at the seat on it. Look at the seat on it. Stunning, aren't they? Absolutely stunning.
we're here with another legend. Another sidecar legend, actually. But you do two wheels as well, don't you? Would you say you I would. I wouldn't say I'm a legend, but yes, I race two wheels and three wheels. And I've done a tiny bit of car racing. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I did an A35 and an old Alpha and a classic Mini, which yeah, was the it. most fun. Yeah, that, they're fun because they're all over the shop, aren't they? That was thanks to the Colburn family. They're amazing. Oh, right. Well, is it good one? I did race... Oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. That was an MGY type. I raced oh, at Goodwood at the Revival. That was pretty yeah. um, cool. The Revival's good, isn't it? To, yeah. to race a motorbike and a car at the same Revival was amazing. Is it two wheels at the Revival? or Usually, yeah. yeah. So when did you start with sidecars? When did I start yeah. with sidecars? OK, well, this actually popped up on my Facebook memories, and that's how we all seem to work out when we did things. And it was about eight years ago. And I didn't start racing properly then, but I got a go in a DDM, a Dave DeMott um, F2 sidecar, and we raced at Cadwell. Um, with Harry Payne, um, who helped me sort of get going. And then it took a few more years, I think, before I could... Because I, I own my own sidecar. I needed yeah. to buy one, really. That's how, yeah. how you go. So yeah, so was it, was it a natural progression for you? Or were you asked to do it? Is it something you always wanted to do? I don't think sidecar racing is <laughs> a natural progression for a two-wheeled racer, necessarily. <laughs> but it was something I wanted to do. Yeah, because yeah, they uh, are pretty awesome, I must admit. They're my favourite out, out of it all, I must admit. Especially seeing them go around the TT is just like... It's a massive spectacle. And I think if you've... If you've never seen it and you go and watch it, I think it blows your mind. That's what's so amazing about sidecar. That's what's so brilliant about sidecar racing, and that's why we really need to keep it going. Yeah, it is. It's a wonderful sport. So the, the trust issues, is it more for the... Is it, have, you, have you got to have more trust in, in, in the rider, or have you got to have trust in the, the, the person who's, who's hanging the bummy, up, shall we say? Yeah, sidecar racing is all about trust. Um... But I remember speaking to Dave Molyneux, obviously uh, he is a proper legend Mm, in sidecar racing, and he said, you do your job, Maria, and they do their job, and if you're both doing it well, then it works. So you have to have that mutual trust initially. But that's what's fantastic about my new passenger, Alice. It really has clicked. And we've done three meetings the end of this year. We've not been off the podium, I think. so it's and we finished at Lydon at the sidecar burnout with a win. So on, perfect end to the season. It. Yeah. It's a it's a real <laughs> yeah. cool little track. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a lovely little place. Uh, so this year, if you, if you want to sort of tell us about this year, you know what you did, where you've been, and how it all went, really. Um, yes. So started the season um, at the members' meeting at Goodwood on two wheels on a beautiful Triumph owned by Sam Broad. Had a great time there. Um, the Dukes actually introduced sidecars, modern sidecars, to that event. So next year I'd really like oh, to be yeah, taking to. my sidecar oh, there. Oh, yeah, you got to. Uh, and we've done, obviously, the main event being uh, the TT. I did the Northwest just before that as sort of warm-up. Um, and then took my Super Twin and my sidecar to the TT. I got PB um, lap times on my sidecar just. Um, and then really... We've come back. I did the Festival of Speed at Goodwood on my sidecar. Oh, good, yeah. Took um, different people up the hill, but also started back working with Alice Smith, um, this young passenger. She's very talented. Um, and then uh, I did a few other meetings, including the revival. And like I say, we did those three sidecar races and we've not been off the podium. That's fantastic. So plans for next year? Anything lined up? Try and make it all happen again. Yeah, yeah. Need a lottery win in the <laughs> meantime. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the main plan is to go to the TT again with a super twin and my sidecar. And this time I'll have Alice Smith on the side. We'll be an all-female team and that's going to be really exciting. That's going to be good. So uh, learning the TT, how long would you say it, 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 it took you to learn the circuit? How many, how many years do you think? Well, there? during this event this weekend, we've just worked out that it's my 30th year in racing next really? year. Obviously, I've not been riding yeah, sidecars yeah. that long, but I've been going to the Isle of Man nearly as long. Um, so, um, but how long did it take me to learn it? Two, yeah, you have... Three years, four years? Well, I don't think you ever stop oh, learning. No, That's no it's the like point. any circuit, really, I presume, isn't it? It's, it's just... No, it's not like any other circuit. <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, it's, it's a, like it's most course, circuits, yeah, yeah. And it's very different. Yeah, I didn't mean and to insult it... you like that. I no, no. It was, every circuit, you know, you always find something. But, yeah, it is awesome. It's just... No, well, I think that's what's 
that's what's different yeah. about a road course is that it does actually change they do make changes um, with the road surface and sometimes the actual road has changed and the TT course that has happened um, but yeah you're all I think what's important is when you go to the TT is that you always have respect for the place so that's yeah. the key thing no well thank you very much for talking to us again it's been a pleasure <laughs> oh, this is a pleasure talking to you <laughs> and um, good luck next year thank you very much Tiger, nice and big, you see. You wouldn't be able to ride it, mate. You wouldn't be able to get your feet on the ground. See, whole corner cut. Every single British manufacturer. Unbelievable. Royal Enfields, look. See, I do like a Royal Enfield. I was going to go for a 50s, 60s bike. I think I'd have to be one of these. 1960 Royal Enfield Bullet, 500cc. Stunning. Here we go, this is a Royal Enfield, 1959, 250cc, Crusader Sports, look at those dropped handlebars. I keep picking all, me, all the ones I'm interested in, I'm very sorry everybody. Nice Montgomery, Montgomery, 1000cc, I don't know what year it is though actually, 1924, yeah, 1924 Montgomery. I can't believe we had so many British marks and they've all gone nearly all of them are gone you know this was a, this was the motorcycle capital of the world Birmingham and I say they're all gone such a shame another one Mark V Twin Matchless I think it's an old Grand Prix bike this one I think it's just beautiful the way it's all designed but it's still moving off from the bikes, uh, bicycles aren't we mm. whoever, whoever rebuilt this made a beautiful job of it Pinstriping on it like that. that are just ah, BSAs now loads of BSAs wife's got one of those and gold star i think that was a, that was the bike of the 50s the gold star 
Stunning. And we're here with James Hewing, the curator of this wonderful place. Um, tell us about it, please, James, because it's just a whole cornucopia. Yeah. It's a good word for, a, <laughs> but, for an afternoon. Well, do you know what? You're here on our... 40th anniversary um, weekend so yeah 40, 40 years we've been open um, 1984 to, to now um, but we've tied that in with our museum live event which is a an open weekend where you can come for free we like the public obviously we let the public in for free and all our visitors and there's a small charge for car parking motorcycles are free and you've seen today the crowd oh, it's um, you know we get literally thousands and thousands of visitors over over the course of the weekend over the Saturday and Sunday yeah so is it a big number over the years is it sort of is it is it a quarter of a million half well, yeah is it, well you actually hit the nail on the head because we're a conference business as well and a lot of the conferences quite often they're engineering sort of base so we have JLR you know Jaguar Land Rover as a, as a client for example and so quite often those people that are coming to a conference will also visit so the number is around with unique visitors and people that are coming over from the conference business it is actually around a quarter of a million a year yeah it's amazing isn't it it's impressive so how many because it's all British bikes I mean we had a few of the Japanese bikes as we come in the old Grand Prix bikes and bits and pieces but it is all British bikes, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, on this weekend, anything goes. So we're starting up Japanese bikes, we've got German bikes, we've got the European bikes, we've got everything. We've got Harleys, we've got everything. But when we're open normally, the other 363 days, <laughs> we're 100% British. And that's always been the idea of the museum since it opened. It um, it was the, the brainchild, it was the, the passion of one man, a guy called Roy Richards. And Roy had made his, his money in planting tire in the 1960s and 70s and those huge tower cranes you know and when he sold the business and retired he didn't put his money into sort of sitting on a desert island um, <laughs> he wanted to do something for Britain because Roy was a great patriot and he loved anything British but he also his passion was also British bikes and especially Norton's so the collection is actually based on his, his own personal collection but because he was such a patriot to answer your question it always was and always will be uniquely British, it'll be only ever be a British collection, and and in doing that, it's it's a good thing because you can be very focused. You're not going off in ten di different directions at once, and so you can tell the story of the British industry as well as showing the bikes. Yeah, because we started off with the sort of bicycle base as you because you've organised it very well actually. It's very impressive. We started off with the bicycle base, and then you sort of work your way around. You can see that like, a singer. I mean, you, most people have never. Realise that, or they think of a sewing machine, yeah. yeah. And of course, some of these companies—that's what they were. Mm. They were companies making other things. Um, Rover, for example, Singer, all sorts of names that people would recognise. Rally, yeah, Rally, um, yeah. And they made other products as as well as motorcycles, yeah. and and so people would recognise a lot of the names. Um, you know, some of them stopped making motorcycles well over 100 years ago, but people would recognise quite a lot of those early names. Yeah, I mean, I've got a fair knowledge of, of, of the names. You know, growing up, obviously, a father was interested in bikes and a brother was interested in bikes. But a lot of these I've never heard of, absolutely never heard of any, a lot of them. Yeah. And they're so impressive, a lot of them. The engineering has gone into them in the 1920s and 30s. It's yeah. quite stunning, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a time of great innovation. And um, the thing was, especially in this area, which was, as, as many people know, was the centre of British motorcycle manufacture, the biggest motorcycle manufacturing industry in the world for a long time, until the 1960s, with all the big names people have recognised, BSA Triumph. But as you say, there was a lot to small makes and, and that was because locally it was nationally as well but especially locally where a lot of the part suppliers were based as well and that's what tends to happen you've got places like Lucas and so you've got industries feeding into an industry and all those industries coalesced pretty much right in the Birmingham area and so what you got around the in the interwar years but especially in the 1920s and after the First World War you got every sort of little engineering firm making a motorcycle and sometimes they only made one or two or three and this is where some of these real weird and wonderful names come from yeah no it's wonderful um so was the building purposely built made for this was it the purpose built building for the museum or yeah yeah roy bought the land in the um late 1970s and 
specifically for building the museum yeah yeah he, he wanted to do something like as I say he was a great patriot and he wanted to do something for the for the country so because obviously British bikes there's been resurgent of course but British bikes were the industry had, had almost gone by then and he wanted to sort of preserve the the heritage so people would understand what a massive industry it once yeah, was it was the world leading wasn't it? up until probably the 70s then, I suppose it was late 60s early 70s when the Japanese come along and and, and and sort of took over, really, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, pr- produced a range of bikes that were more, you know, palatable to a wider audience. And so, it was a an unfortunate, but in the circumstances, probably inevitable decline, and one that many people didn't want to see. But um, and that was why Roy did what he did. He never wanted people to forget that we were the world leading, uh, the world leader in producing motorcycles. Very impressive. Now, I'd like to talk to you about that horrible day in 2003, September, when it, the museum caught fire. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, before my time. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did it, um, I mean, were a lot of the bikes damaged, or was it one particular area? Yeah, it was um, halls five and four, so the further, furthest halls, but... Um, um, of course, things make the news, and you know it look it's a big story. And of course, it was a, a, a big event. But um, we were open again within a year, mm. and um, all the um, very rare bikes they were all restored, and so um, within quite a short space of time, actually. Yeah. And yeah. again, that was that was Roy's drive and tenacity that 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 made that happen. And you know, a lot of people wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been able to do that. But um, within a, a year, we were reopened, and we've got far more bikes to. Today than we ever had pr- prior to that um, that event yeah so we came back much stronger but much more quickly than most people would think either yeah, yeah. no it's a, it's a good day out and we, we were listening to the drag bike starting up earlier yeah and the noise was just yeah and that's the, the say that just the variation you've got of everything it's just unbelievable well do you know the thing about the museum and it's something we've driven for the last sort of decade we, we try to be we're very different um from other museums and that we do use the inventory so you've seen unique double engine drag bikes started up today um, you know you'll, you'll have seen a lot of bikes started up at this event but not only that but we have a friend scheme where people can ride the bikes um, and again that's unique in museums where you know m- museums can be a bit sort of dull and dusty yeah, and, and you've got to keep there's nothing yeah but, a bike or a car just sitting there but that's not like that here no, because no. you know if you're a member of the friends scheme you can ride virtually any bike in, in the collection and we turn them out you know every few weekends in the summer and uh, it's a real really it is I mean a unique's an overused term but it's a yeah. real unique thing it is it's stunning it's absolutely beautiful yeah so it's the place to come. You do need a day to look around it, don't you, really? Yeah, I mean, some people, if they're coming from Japan or America or Australia, they come for three days. But, yeah, but you do need a day, really, yeah. yeah. No, it is, it's a wonderful museum, and people, you've got to come and see it. I didn't realise it was here, and I'm definitely coming back again because it is wonderful, and you must come and see it. Yeah, I mean, we're easy to find. It's all here, really, Birmingham Airport, the NEC. We're all on the same junction, junction yeah. six of the M42, so it's uh, very central in the country, not... Not, not too hard to find. Yeah, well, thank you for a wonderful day, James. It's been wonderful talking to you. No, you're welcome. We'll yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, wow. right. that, that was good, wasn't it? The National Motorcycle Museum in Birmingham. Fantastic yes. day. You got to see yeah. some nice bikes. I did. I'm a bit, I'm a bit, I'm a bit naughty, really, because all the bikes we talked about are the bikes that I liked. Yeah, but that don't mind. Don't mind. <laughs> I mean, you like doing stuff that you want to do, don't you? You might as well do the old lights and goodbyes and all that now. Go on, like you normally do. Go on. I think I want to, yeah. Yeah, no, go on, go on. Well, it's worth coming here, people. You must make a visit. You've got to make a day of it. It is absolutely, truly fantastic. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up and a lovely comment. We'll be most appreciated thank you so so much i don't think you did that as well this week you know we're rolling we're rolling right guess who we've bumped into sorry you're asking the wrong person <laughs> we'll scrap that question and start with another one <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a bit it's a bit it's a bit um yeah it's a bit oh look it's mr parish 